when we work with people, striving to get them to understand the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. We're made so very aware, aware of the fact that little is known of true, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. And certainly those of us in the church need to make sure that we stay knowledgeable, <clears throat> that we stay sharp in our understanding the truth of God concerning the church. In our day, and for a number of years now, there have been those in the church who basically wanted to make it a human institution, who have little regard for the authority of the Bible and certainly little regard to learning how to ascertain the authority of their Savior, Jesus Christ. It's hard for me to understand how most know Christ saying, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? and not have a concern about understanding how to ascertain their Lord's authority as set out in His last will and testament. But they do. Let me boldly say, and as plainly as I know how, that the Church of Christ, as that term is used, and get this, as I say most often, and defined in the New Testament of the Christ, regardless what other people say about it, as that term is used in the New Testament, is an undenominational institution. Now, don't confuse undenominational with non-denominational. Non-denominations exist around, and they basically are known nowadays and for the past 30 years or so as community churches. They usually are under one particular preacher, and he pretty much controls the whole thing. And it centers around his magnetic personality. At least that's the way many people think of them. And you can see these all on television if you care to look at them. They basically are saying, as long as you believe in Christ, the Son of God, and you've taken him as your Savior, whatever you think that means, then you're welcome here. And they mean we don't teach any particular view from any particular denomination, so we're uh, non-denominational. But when I say undenomination, I mean the church that Jesus built is not a denomination at all, and you can't read the denominations in the New Testament as we've known them in history for about 500 years. <clears throat> we know basically what is Protestant denominationalism. Why did they get the name Protestant? Because people like John Calvin and Martin Luther and people of that caliber back in the 1500s roughly decided that the Roman Catholic Church was corrupt and they sought to reform it so that time of history religiously is called the Reformation in Europe. Well if you have something that never was authorized by the Bible and itself has become corrupt if you reform it you still have that which is not authorized by the Bible. Never seemed in those men's minds to go back beyond Roman Catholicism to the New Testament as their sole rule of faith and practice and have just what we read of in the New Testament. Now last week when I was talking about the authenticity of the New Testament, I mentioned that it is the primary source for understanding what true Christianity is. I mentioned that, I think, even in the class this morning. If you remove the knowledge of the New Testament from your mind, you wouldn't know anything about the church. Now, you might know a whole lot about denominationalism. And thus, you would know something that came from the New Testament. But the concept of denominationalism as it has appeared about 500 years ago and continues to this day is 1,500 years too late to be the Lord's Church because the Lord's Church was founded on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ as the inspired Luke 
records in Acts chapter 2. And it was Jesus preceding his death and resurrection while in his earthly ministry who said in Matthew 16 verse 18, made this promise that he kept, I will build my church. Notice singular. Yet today, most people just don't have an understanding of the church that is not based upon the denominational concept of the church, which is all these different churches with different names believing different things. I don't know why people can't take the New Testament, the New Testament of Christ, and learn about the church that is of Christ that he promised to build that he did build Acts 2 and to which he has all those he saves when they're obedient to the gospel Acts 2 38 41 42 and 47 the simplicity of New Testament Christianity is rather amazing <clears throat> and yet people they want their likes and dislikes and they don't know how to separate their likes and dislikes from just what the Lord said so we're not talking about a man-made institution when we talk about the Church of Christ. Let me say this again, as it's defined and used in your own New Testament. We're not talking about a non-denominational church, which really means all denominational. So the church is undenominational. It's not connected in any form or fashion to what is called Protestant denominational Christianity. And because of that, it stands opposed to the concept of denominationalism. We are not denying that there aren't sincere, pious people in all churches that claim to believe in God and the Bible is the Word of God and Jesus as the Christ. But if you know anything about the teaching of the scriptures at all, you know that Christ requires far more than that to become a Christian. That is, far more knowledge than that. Are those things essential? Yes, I don't know of any denomination that doesn't teach some truth. But it's not a matter of some truth. It's a matter of the totality of truth that is the New Testament. James 1.25 calls the New Testament the perfect, which means complete, law of liberty. We're invited, we're admonished, we're rebuked, we're taught throughout the New Testament to study, 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 study. Do so with an honest and good heart, Luke 8.15, and with a determination to alter our lives to fit the truth we learn from the Scriptures. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples, indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus prayed on the night before he was crucified, Father, sanctify them, that means set them apart from the world, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. We don't need any manuals written by men, or catechisms, or prayer books, or anything like that to guide the church. We have the will of Christ and the words of Christ in the New Testament of Christ to teach us about the gospel of Christ, which gospel is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. And in obedience to the gospel, the church of Christ comes into existence and is sustained by the members following the truth, studying the truth holding tenaciously to the truth about salvation in the church. Thus, we are taught to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know that our labor is not in vain. Now, here it is, in the Lord. Now, we learn that in the Lord means in Christ, in the spiritual body of Christ, in the church, not in a denomination. If you were to talk to Paul about Protestant denominationism, He'd have no idea what you're talking about. And that would be true throughout the first century, the second and third century, although apostasy was taking place at that time as they departed from the New Testament pattern. And out of that apostasy in about three or four hundred years, Roman Catholicism came to existence. I think it's highly significant that we don't recognize that there was just simply Catholicism, Catholic meaning universal. 
I remember one time up in Syracuse, New York, we were knocking doors, and one of the preachers who had come over from Rochester to help us knock doors, and that's primarily Catholic country. The Catholics would say, well, we don't take anything from anybody unless he's Catholic. Well, he knew Catholic meant universal. So when one of them told them that at the door, he just said, this is as Catholic as it can be. I don't know how more universal it can be than the Word of God. The guy took it. Because people use terms have no idea what they mean, or else they give their meaning to it. Yes, the Church of Christ is Catholic. It's universal. One church, universal. That's what Jesus said he would build, Matthew 16, 18. I have no problem if you mean that, but as it identifies a certain denomination with a certain body of doctrine that's headed by the Pope, yeah, i got problems with that. But there was the old Catholic Church. Then there was a division between the Eastern Orthodox and what became, and that's why it's called that, Roman Catholicism. Because the head of the Church of the Roman Catholics is the Pope in Rome. And thus there was a division even in that. And out of that Roman Catholic Church that dominated Europe, as I've said, there came then the protesters who wanted to reform the church. So that's the Protestants. I doubt many people who know the word Protestant and call themselves Protestant have any idea whatsoever that it means protest. That it means they protested originally the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church and that they went about to change all that. It's what Luther did. It's what Calvin did, et cetera, et cetera. And that the roots and the foundations of modern Protestant denominationalism is found in the teaching of basically those two men. What we need to sound out today is this. We have the same word that was given, and it is infallible, given in the first century. It is still the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. It is still the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, Luke 8.11. It is still the instrument the Holy Spirit uses to convict men of sin, convert them to Christ, and to keep them faithful in the Lord's church, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6.17. Jesus still meant what he said, and he certainly said what he meant. When he said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Every pope that's ever been is going to be standing right in line to be judged by the Bible that he thinks is not enough. Because he thinks it is the New Testament plus the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. That's what governs people. I know that to be the case. Because first of all, I can study it and read it, what they said of themselves. And next of all, some of you will remember we debated that very point in 2000 with a Roman Catholic priest who is a Ph.D. from Oxford and teaches or did at the Catholic University here. Thus, we are heralding out, and that's one thing that the Reformers did, was to get the Bible into the hands of ordinary person, get it translated into their own, their own tongues. And for that, I highly commend them. Because there was a time when they didn't want you to have the Bible in your own hands. And they wanted to be able, as Catholic doctrine says, to tell you what the Bible teaches. Thus, Catholics don't really study their Bibles. Because they'll just listen to the priest. And if you understood the whole Roman Catholic system, you'd know why. It is through the priest, the clergy of the Roman Catholic Church, that the grace of God's extended through the seven sacraments. And if they make you anathema or cut off from the church, you're cut off from the seven sacraments and you're fallen from grace. And thus, if you know Roman Catholic doctrine and you're faithful, put that in quotes, as a Roman Catholic, you're not going to go against the priesthood. You're not going against the Pope and the College of Cardinals and the synods and so forth. Now let me point this out. Where in the Bible do you read anything about that? You have to come way this side of the first century in New Testament Christianity. So we have the Word of God. Why not go back to it? Why not learn the plan of salvation from Christ Himself in the inspired Word? For all Scripture is given to the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. That means spiritually complete. 
Thoroughly and thoroughly furnished unto every good work. What more do I need than the Bible in general and the New Testament particularly to know how to become a Christian, how to live the Christian life, and how to go to heaven? And what the church is. Let the New Testament of Christ define the church of Christ. Now, is that the only term to refer to the institution of those Christ saved? No. Because there is no proper name for the Lord's church. Like your last name. There are terms of designation. And that's what we need to understand. And if we're going to call the church anything, call it as the oracles of God and use one of those terms. Or why the churches of Christ all tend to use churches of Christ? Because it certainly shows the relationship of the saved to the one who saved it and the, and the relationship of the Savior to the saved. But I don't know of anybody that knows their Bible will say that's the only term you can use to refer to the saved. And many times we'll talk about the body of Christ. And we'll talk about the family of God. And we'll talk about the kingdom of Christ. And we'll talk about the temple of God, as the New Testament does. And we're talking about the institution of the saved, which Christ adds every one that's obedient to the gospel. Why obedient to the gospel? Because it's the power of God to save people. How is God going to save you apart from His power to save? Well, He can save me any way He wanted to. Yes, but how did He want to? How did He tell you that He would? It's through the gospel, the glad tidings of Christ. Specifically, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, if you read in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's the fundamentals of it. So we have today the idea in denominationalism of many bodies, many churches, different names, different creeds. Whether the members of those churches really know those things or not, that's what it is. There was a time when they knew why they were Methodist and why they were Baptist and why they were Presbyterians. They had a certain creed that says you believe this, that's what you are. Nowadays it's all been blurred. That's the reason there's so many going to and a part of these community churches. They may be from all these different denominations with the different names, but they basically have come to the conclusion that if I believe in Christ as my Savior and I've asked Him to save me, then that's all that's essential. Nothing else really then is binding upon you that's necessary to go to heaven. All right, that's fine. Show me in the Bible where that's taught. And they couldn't. Their life depends on it. And their eternal life does. Matthew 16, 18, to which we referred. Also Paul writing to the church in Corinth, the 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20, said there's one body, our church. Why can't we be content with that? It's that simple. How do I know that? Well, it's like we sing with the kids. Jesus loves me, this I know. Well, the Bible tells me so. You see, there's a lot of unlearning that denominational people have to do because they have no concept of the church except a denominational entity. You are saved by Christ in whatever way you think that you ask Christ to save you and then you pick out some denomination that suits you best and you become a part of it and you do whatever's there. But that's not in your Bible. It's not taught in the New Testament. That's what men teach. The denominations will tell you whichever one you're talking to or talking about or whoever it is you're talking with about them that they're founded by men. You ask a Lutheran, he's going to tell you Martin Luther did it. Now, Luther won't have them called after him, but they did anyway after he's dead. That might tell us something right there, make a difference what you really want. They're going to do it anyway after you're dead. <laughs> whether it's religious or anything else. But nevertheless, that's what happened. And if you want to talk about the Methodist Church, well, just talk about John Charles Wesley, who wanted to reform the uh, Church of England because they thought it was too stilted. So they pretty much went to shouting happy Methodist, and that's what they did. But the Church of our Lord is founded by Jesus Christ, period. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, to which I've already referred you. Now, why can't we rest with that? It's simple. It's plain. Christ built his church. He purchased it with his precious blood, Acts 20 and 28. It belongs to him. Now, you have various human heads of the various denominations, but not so with the Lord's church. Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23, and other places, but that in particular, makes it clear Christ is the head of his church. Not Christ and somebody. Or somebody and not Christ. 
that Christ is the head of his church. Again, the Bible is the only rule of faith and practice. But that's not necessarily so with the denominations. The denominations because they all differ on something and think the Bible differs. Now, if you go back 150 years, the denominations each thought they were acceptable on the basis of what their creed taught. And that separated them from one another. They didn't seem to get it that if you have the Bible and the Bible only and you study it and you honestly look at it and rightly divide it, that you don't need anything else and you can all be one. And it does all begin with the right disposition of heart toward God and His Word and respect for His authority and accepting the final rule of faith and practice as the absolute objective standard of truth. And that's the only thing we'll use. That right there would go so far to changing people to be what the Bible says they ought to be as Christians. If they would just say, we're just going to go by the New Testament and the New Testament only. But they don't. Yet the Bible is the only source of instruction. We quoted 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 a moment ago. Why do you need anything else? If you want to know what the Lord wants you to know in order how to be saved from your sins, go to His last will and testament. You know, you know, if you have a will, that's where you put your, your will <laughs> concerning what you want done after you are dead no longer able to be here and tell people. That's what Christ did. He's left us His last will and testament. You want to know what Christ said? Well, He would have done, He said this when He was on the earth. I'm not interested in what He said on the earth from that standpoint. I'm interested in what He left in His last will and testament because He's not here any longer to tell me things. And people that say he does talk to them, but they speak contrary to what the New Testament says, are a liar of the truth not in them. That's the way John put it. People teach contrary to the doctrine of Christ. They have not God in the doing of it. Second John 7, 8, 9, 10. Whosoever transgresseth or goeth onwards, the American Sanders has it, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. What's hard to understand about that? The Holy Spirit had John the Apostle, the Apostle of Love, say that to Christians. You believe him? Well, if you don't, you better. All of us. Denominations wear names, human names. People contrive names. Hyphenated Christians, we call it. Methodist Christians, Baptist Christians, Presbyterian Christians. Open your Bible. See if you can find any of those in it. You can't because that idea didn't originate to 1,500 long years after the church was built and you read of it in your New Testament. They follow men. And yet that's refuted and condemned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13 saying we ought to all be of the same mind and the same judgment. How can that be if you're going to follow different men? When Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I the son of man am? And they named several different people. The people were saying that he was. Then he wasn't any of them. But he said, whom do you say that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And notice the blessing. Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee. Denominationalism is revealed by flesh and blood. But my Father which is in heaven. In other words, you listen to the revelation of God. And He's the one who has a right to say whatever He wants to say about salvation and what man needs. Again, there's that multiplicity of churches that are supposed to be acceptable to God, but they're unknown to the Bible. But the Lord's church is mentioned in the Bible. That's the reason I say Church of Christ as it is defined and used in the scriptures that's the only way you can do it now can you make the term church of christ a denominational term yeah if you think when you use church of christ of just another denomination then you may be using a scriptural term but your understanding of it's wrong i don't know of any members of denomination that say it's essential for you in order to go to heaven to be a member of this denomination in fact, the idea that floats around has for years and years doesn't make a real difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. You go to your church and I'll go to mine and we'll all get to heaven together. Give me book, chapter, and verse where you came with that from the Bible. And you can't do it. 
But membership in the church Jesus built and purchased with his blood, of which he is the only head, and to which he adds all those he saved, is essential to the salvation of mankind. Paul said so in Ephesians 5 and verse 23. The Lord adds the saved to his church. And the New Testament bears out these identifying marks of the church. Now, if you get lost out here in Houston, can't find your way back home, maybe somebody have your fingerprints, and they set you apart from every other individual person and all the billions of us, and they start looking for you in that way. Or if they want to look at the color of your hair, if you got any, uh, where you wear glasses or what your clothes were the last time you had on or if you had any on and whatever. Nowadays, you never know. But they try to set you up to where you stand apart from everybody else so you can be identified. That's so simple. But not the spiritual body of Christ. And yet the New Testament has the identifying marks of the church. And if you know the New Testament and it's identifying marks, you can find it. And if you don't find one around you, you can obey the truth and be it. Some of my brethren don't even know that. They think if there's not one already established, they don't know what to do. Well, start one. <laughs> do you have your Bible? <laughs> do you have the Word of God? Is the Word of God still the seat of the kingdom? Or have you got to have an established congregation before it's the seat of the kingdom? No. These denominations preach many gospels, different twists on it. But there's only one gospel, according to Galatians 1, 8, and 9, that Paul preached. And everybody else has been a Christian, a true Christian preached. One gospel, that's the power of God to save. If you take these different uh, manuals, prayer books, creeds, catechisms, they have to rewrite those things every few years. Some of them write, rewrite them every year because they'll have their conference, and in that conference they determine what's right and wrong for that church, and then they'll put out after the conference over what they decided would be binding on the churches. But the Bible, including the New Testament, remains the same, Matthew 24, 35. Hasn't changed. Denominationalism says, oh, there are many faiths. Sometimes you get somebody walk up to you and say, what faith are you? Anytime somebody asks that question, I know they have no concept of New Testament Christianity. If I were to answer them saying, well, I'm of the faith of which Paul was that you read of in your own New Testament, they would know what I was talking about. Now, if I were to say, let's study the New Testament and it alone and let's learn, you probably would find, no, I won't, but may and we should be looking for them that's our job as the church to be looking for souls to be saved there's only one faith if you look at Jude 3 we're to contend for it it's been once for all delivered to the saints one faith means one source of our confidence trust and belief in God in Christ and that's the New Testament specifically it's here been here since the first century Jude said we ought to contend for it if you look out among the different denominations, they have different kinds of baptisms. Some will sprinkle water on you. Some will pour water on you. Some will baptize you, but not baptize you for or unto the remission of sins. So there's many baptisms. But by the time Paul, by inspiration, wrote the, church to the, uh, the letter to the church in Ephesus, he said, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament, that there's one baptism, and that's about 62 A.D. I don't care how many more baptisms there were or, meant or are mentioned in the Bible. By, by A.D. 62, roughly, Ephesians 4, verse 5, said there was one. How do I determine what that one is? How do I determine? Because there was the baptism of John the Baptist. There's the baptism of fire. How do I determine what that one baptism is? Jesus said... All power hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Don't you know it's the baptism that goes to the end of the world? So it's the baptism of the Great Commission. What was that? A baptism in water? To the one who's believed in Christ, repented of sins, confessed one's faith in Christ, Christ and qualified himself to be baptized in water by the authority of Christ for unto the remission or forgiveness of sins. So that one baptism that Paul said existed in Ephesians chapter 5 and or chapter 4 verse 5 
even while the New Testament was still being written. That one baptism, water baptism. That everybody must obey and must be immersed in to become a Christian. As Peter said, baptism doth also now save us. 1 Peter 3.21 And of course, the denominations, they join churches. And that's all they talk about. But the universal church that Jesus built and purchased with His blood, when a person obeys the gospel of Christ, the Lord adds them to the church of Christ. And you can't join the church of Christ. Now, you can associate yourself with different congregations of the Lord's people because those are the largest and smallest organized entity of the one world, one worldwide church of Christ, one universal church. But the church that is the spiritual body of Christ universal the Lord himself adds you to it when you from the heart obey the doctrine or the gospel of Christ. Now the denominations say, well, we're just different branches. They misunderstand that parable. Because the Lord said that those branches were individual people, not churches. He says that you abide in me, the true vine, speaking to individuals, John 15, 1 through 6. So individuals here believe and obey the gospel. The Lord adds those individuals to his church. And they collectively, others having done the same, are unified and in fellowship. Because they've all done what put them in fellowship with God. And think fellowship anybody that's in fellowship with God. And they have no right to fellowship anybody that's outside of the fellowship of God. And that's what John said in 2 John. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, you don't bid him Godspeed. You don't do that at all. You don't have any association with you. You don't give him encouragement. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is advocating, and I'm just commenting here, is pushing, is promoting division. Let's go back and read it. It's right there. We don't walk by different rules. We walk by the same rule as Paul told the church at Philippi in Philippians 3.16. That rule is the New Testament. And we shouldn't be, as denominational people have at times, thank God for many churches. We better thank God for His one church because then are Christians and Christians only and the only Christians. And the individual name of members is Christian. It means of Christ. And the Lord gave us that name. There are those, and even in the church nowadays, who say, well, doctrine is really inconsequential. It doesn't make any difference. And they basically reduced it down to what I said in the beginning. Just believe in God and the Christ and that you some way have appealed to Him for your salvation. And nothing else matters. You just do what you want to do. And you can see that in certain members of the Lord's church as they leave the divine pattern of salvation that is the New Testament, the infallible blueprint for building the Lord's church. Now, this is only a brief contrast you can develop every one of these to understand it even better but this ought to be something that whets the appetite of anybody that can be described as hungering and thirsting after righteousness as Jesus said we must if we would be filled with it so as surely as you can't preach everything there is in the Bible for the needs of man in one sermon I suggest we've covered a lot here that ought to whet your appetite to know a whole lot more about what New Testament Christianity really is. And I use the term New Testament Christianity to separate it from denominational Christianity because denominational Christianity is not New Testament Christianity. I mean the Christianity that comes only from the New Testament. And the church is made of Christians and Christians only and the only Christians because the Lord that only puts those in His church, the blood-bought institution. We studied what to do in this sermon to become a Christian. You can't, do, you can't become a Christian unless you obey it from the heart. The child of God, if you've wandered on any of these or other matters pertaining to being godly, living the Christian life, then God's second law of pardon is repent of sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness, and once again walk the straight and narrow way of truth. If you're then, therefore, subject to the gospel of Christ, we invite you to obey Him while we stand and sing.